Rome, an empire of unmatched power and glory, where senators debated the fate of vast territories and legions marched to the edges of the known world. But like a towering monument facing the elements, even Rome had its vulnerabilities. From internal strife to external threats, a series of events slowly chipped away at its foundations. Join us today as we traverse centuries, navigating through political intrigues, economic challenges, and military defeats to uncover the intricate tapestry of reasons that led this iconic empire to its inevitable downfall. At its zenith, the Roman Empire, under Emperor Trajan, spanned from Armenia to the Atlantic Ocean. This vast realm, teeming with thriving cities and a burgeoning population, was supported by disciplined soldiers and a robust civil administration. Its thriving trade networks allowed goods, made by distant professionals, to be used even by modest households. Cultural unity prevailed, as the educated elite believed that Roman civilization was the pinnacle of human achievement. This belief, rooted in a deep understanding of Greek and Roman literature and rhetoric, lent the empire its ideological backbone. The empire was not just mighty but resilient. An intricate financial system enabled significant tax collections, which funded a vast regular army. The cursus honorum provided a structured ladder for ambitious aristocrats to gain exposure to both military and civil domains, while centurions, bridging the gap between the top echelons and foot soldiers, brought leadership and discipline to the military ranks. City governance flourished, offering its council members not just responsibilities but lucrative opportunities. The imperial succession was streamlined, thanks to a line of emperors who prudently chose mature and competent successors. The empire's subjects could directly reach out to the more benevolent emperors, making the imperial power palpably accessible. The polytheistic religious landscape was diverse, yet followers coexisted harmoniously, barring a few instances like the suppression of the Bar Kokhba revolt. However, the empire also had its frailties. It was rooted in a rudimentary subsistence economy with limited understanding of health and hygiene. Their advanced aqueducts notwithstanding, clean water was a luxury. Streets often bore the brunt of waste disposal, and disease was rampant. Even during periods of prosperity, the shadow of famine loomed large, and a woman needed to bear an average of six children to sustain the population. Basic amenities like proper nourishment and regular baths were privileges of the elite. The grim reality of infant mortality and diseases like malaria persisted, with the latter even prevalent in the heart of Rome, perhaps exacerbated by the elite's fondness for water features in their estates. In 313 AD, a pivotal shift occurred under Constantine the Great's reign, he officially recognized and tolerated Christianity. Over the years that followed, the quest to shape a unified Christian doctrine unfolded, leading to the establishment of creeds. Yet, defining a single version of the Bible or its teachings remained elusive, with numerous manuscript traditions emerging. While these internal Christian disputes may have impacted the empire's trajectory, actions against nonconforming Christians, or heretics, became commonplace from the 4th century onward. Meanwhile, pagans were mostly overlooked, stemming from the newfound Christian sense of triumph post-Constantine. Christianity's rise saw a shift in cultural values. While the religion opposed practices like sacrifice and magic, Christian emperors began legislating in its favor. By the close of the 4th century, Christianity had become the definitive faith for any ambitious Roman official. The 5th century witnessed the Christian church's exponential rise in wealth. Funds, both state-sponsored and private, poured into infrastructural endeavors like constructing churches, granaries for charitable grain distribution, and hospitals for the destitute. Urban bishops, wielding this newfound wealth, began indulging in grandeur, sometimes rivaling the extravagance of kings, as illustrated by Ammianus Marcellinus. However, the pivot towards Christianity might not have substantially affected the empire's coffers. The erstwhile pagan temples, which had their elaborate rituals and full-time priestly entourage, were equally resource-intensive. The financial strain from the 3rd century had already cast a shadow over these temples. As the Christian clergy's numbers swelled, rivaling the Roman army's size, questions arose regarding their impact on the empire's manpower. A potential decline marked the Roman military during the 4th century. 
there were instances of inflated payrolls leading to corrupt diversions and sold exemptions. The soldiers, now residing in urban areas, seemed more invested in extortion than honing their military skills. This shift, however, was not entirely novel. The Roman military had its fair share of corruption and inefficiencies. Historians still debate the actual decline in the army's effectiveness prior to 376 A.D. Ammianus Marcellinus, a seasoned soldier himself, opined that the might of the Roman legions was rooted in their training and discipline, not sheer numbers or individual prowess. He pointedly criticized Emperor Valentinianite for amplifying the military's arrogance and for practicing unequal justice. Yet, Despite potential constraints, Rome managed to pose a formidable defense against threats well into the latter part of the 4th century. In the times of Constantine, the Franks were relocated to the southern region of the Rhine River. This decision demonstrated Rome's diminishing territorial authority. Fortifications sprung up along the regions housing the Franks, highlighting Rome's attempt to maintain some semblance of control. Meanwhile, the Germanic tribes grew in numbers and posed an increasing threat. Gaul, in the 4th century, faced economic setbacks and insecurity, especially evident in places like Armorica. Persistent pirate attacks left most of the villas in Armorica deserted, and the use of money in the region dwindled by 360. Military changes were afoot too. Soldiers were increasingly stationed in cities, resulting in reduced military training and increased opportunities for extortion. 350 AD brought with it political upheavals. With the Western Emperor Constans away, Magnus Magnentius saw an opportunity and declared himself emperor. This proclamation resulted in a civil war against Constantius. As they were engaged, the Germanic tribes saw an opening to invade Gaul, expanding their territory. Julian's era, beginning in 360, was marked by victories against the Germanic invaders in Gaul. He implemented policies to reduce tax burdens and champion pagan causes. However, his strategies against the Sasanian Persians led to his downfall at the Battle of Samara. Jovian, who succeeded Julian, faced a challenging situation. Stranded and without supplies, he traded territories to ensure a safe passage back to Roman lands. The leadership then transitioned to brothers Valens and Valentinian I, who took measures to strengthen the empire's frontiers and reform taxation systems. While devout Christians, they demonstrated tolerance for various religious beliefs, with Valens being particularly cautious with Christian groups outside his orthodox views. The empire faced a jolt when Valentini and I passed away abruptly, paving the way for his sons, Gratian and Valentini II, to lead. Gratian's rule saw a move away from pagan traditions, symbolized by his removal of the altar of victory and his refusal of the title of Pontifex Maximus. In 376, the eastern territories of the Roman Empire witnessed a massive influx of barbarians, mainly Goths, escaping the terror of the Huns. Instead of being provided relief, these Goths were mistreated by corrupt Roman officials. This led the Goths, now increasingly disgruntled, to arm themselves. They were soon joined by their kin, along with some Alans and Huns, increasing their strength. At the time, Emperor Valens was in Asia, strategizing an attack against the Sasanian Empire with the Eastern Field Army. Calling them back to handle the Goths would have been a time-consuming affair. Moreover, Grecian's forces were preoccupied with Germanic invasions on the Rhine. By 378, Valens decided to face the Gothic threat with his field army, which was significantly smaller than what Julian had led into Mesopotamia just over a decade earlier. The numbers were likely just a fraction of what was theoretically available for duty in the Danube provinces. This imbalance culminated in the Battle of Adrianople on August 9, 378. In this disastrous conflict, not only did the Roman forces suffer immense casualties, but Valens also met his tragic end. Following this defeat, the Balkan provinces lay vulnerable, open to barbarian raids. The remaining Roman garrisons in the area were virtually defenseless, likened to sheep awaiting slaughter. While the cities, with their defensive walls, managed to fend off the barbarians who lacked sophisticated siege mechanisms, the surrounding rural areas faced extensive devastation. Gratian selected Theodosius, a seasoned general from Hispania, to be the new Augustus. 
Over the subsequent four years, Theodosius managed to regain some of the Roman dominance in the east. Between 379 and 380, through mutual agreement, Theodosius wielded power not only over the Eastern Empire, but also over the Diocese of Illyricum. But he faced challenges in amassing Roman troops, so he leaned heavily on barbarian groups which lacked the discipline and allegiance typical of Roman legions. To illustrate, during the Cimbrian War, the Roman Republic had effectively rebuilt vast citizen armies after significant defeats, culminating in the almost complete eradication of the invading barbarian groups. The final settlement with the Goths was met with relief. Unlike past scenarios, these Goths were neither ousted nor reduced to a servile status. They were either incorporated into the imperial forces or resettled in the ruined provinces along the Danube's southern bank. Some view this as the empire's first-time settlement of barbarians who retained their autonomy. Though no official treaty is documented, the Goths resurfaced later as Roman military forces with changed leadership. By 391, Gothic leader Alaric revolted against Rome. While the Goths briefly confronted the emperor, Alaric soon led Theodosius's Gothic units, quelling the uprising. Theodosius's fiscal situation was precarious due to expensive campaigns and a shrinking tax foundation. Barbarian integration also demanded hefty payouts. He faced resistance to tax levies, with riots breaking out, destroying even the emperor's statues. However, he's portrayed as a magnanimous ruler, though personally prudent. By the late 380s, the court resided in Mediolanum. Northern Italy's elite landowners thrived, exploiting the court's demands while oppressing the lower classes. Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan, criticized these elites, advocating that greed destabilizes society. Historically, Theodosius has been praised as a defender of Christian orthodoxy, credited with suppressing paganism. While prior emperors leaned toward semi-Arianism, Theodosius backed Nicene Christianity, which later became the dominant form of Christology. He viewed Arian Christians as irrational zealots. For Ambrose and subsequent Christian scholars, Theodosius was hailed for Christianity's final ascendancy. Contemporary historians, however, consider this a skewed Christian historical interpretation. Theodosius did not eradicate paganism, which persisted until the 7th century. Theodosius found himself confronting a formidable usurper in the West named Magnus Maximus. In 383, Maximus, consolidating power from Roman Britain's outposts, launched an invasion into Gaul. In his rise, he orchestrated Gratian's death and was subsequently recognized as the Western Augustus. His rule in Gaul was marked by the notable execution of Christian dissenters. In a move to appease the Western court, Theodosius transferred control of the dioceses of Dacia and Macedonia to them following the loss of Gaul, Hispania, and Britannia. However, in 387, Maximus' ambitions grew, and he invaded Italy, causing Valentinian II to escape to the east and convert to Nicene Christianity. While Maximus boasted about the barbarian strength in his ranks, Theodosius amassed his own forces, including Goths, Huns, and Alans. As Maximus sought to be recognized as the Western Augustus, Theodosius declined and retaliated. The ensuing civil war in 388 saw Theodosius emerge victorious, though both sides suffered extensive casualties. Welsh lore suggests that Maximus's defeated soldiers relocated to Armorica and, by 400 AD, imperial influence in Armorica waned, giving way to Bugatti control. In the west, Theodosius reinstated a young Valentinian II as Augustus. Alongside, he positioned Arbogast, a Frankish pagan general, as Valentinian's leading general and protector. A rift between the young emperor and Arbogast culminated in Valentinian's suspicious death at just 21. Unable to reach a consensus with Theodosius, Arbogast propelled Eugenius as the Western Emperor. Eugenius, seeking support from pagans, soon engaged in a devastating civil war. Theodosius's forces, however, triumphed at the Battle of the Frigidus, despite significant casualties. This victory left Italy's northeastern boundaries weakly defended thereafter. Theodosius's reign ended with his death in early 395, entrusting the empire to his inexperienced sons, Honorius in the west and Arcadius in the east. 
Stilicho, tied to Theodosius's family by marriage, rose as Honorius's protector and aimed to control both halves of the empire. However, in Constantinople, Rufinus had already cemented his dominance. This initiated a phase where the empire was fragmented, lacking a singular leadership until the West's significant decline. Honorius and Arcadius, trapped in political webs, failed to exert meaningful influence throughout their reigns. Stilicho's attempts to consolidate the empire under his rule only resulted in consistent opposition from the Eastern Court's leadership. During the tenure of Stilicho and the subsequent period, the Roman military's response to threats was remarkably lackluster. Notably absent was evidence of robust native field forces, and even the foreign troops that did exist lacked essential components like discipline training, adequate remuneration, or consistent supply lines. While local defenses showed sporadic efficiency, these moments were often paired with a distancing from central governance and its associated tax burdens. Paradoxically, in several regions, barbarians who were nominally under Roman control turned their weapons on the Bugatti Romanized populations that held onto traditional Roman cultural elements. The Western emperors of the 5th century were, for the most part, notably inept rulers, largely ineffectual and dominated by their courts. The few exceptions to this pattern were responsible for fleeting, yet impressive, periods of Roman resurgence. A possible factor contributing to Rome's decline was corruption, particularly the misdirection of funds away from military needs. The wealthy senatorial elite in Rome grew in influence as the 5th century progressed. While they verbally endorsed the idea of a strong military, they were unwilling to financially support it or contribute their own manpower as recruits. Yet, these elites generously funneled their wealth into the coffers of the Christian church. On a more localized level, from the beginning of the 4th century, town councils saw a diminishment of their assets and influence. Power increasingly gravitated to a handful of local strongmen who operated outside legal constraints. The Balkan regions descended into chaos in the absence of a strong leadership. Alaric, having anticipated a promotion to the rank of Magister Militum following the Battle of the Frigidus, was left disillusioned. Rallying his Gothic followers, he carved out a sphere of influence for himself, scorching the earth up to the very walls of Constantinople. Though Alaric sought a stable position within the Roman bureaucratic framework, the Roman courts never fully embraced his aspirations. His followers, constantly on the move, couldn't establish a permanent settlement for agriculture. Departing the empire to confront the Huns, the very threat they had fled from in 376, wasn't a viable option for them either. Concurrently, the Hunnic activities continued to instigate further tribal migrations. These migrating tribes frequently posed threats to the Roman Empire. Significantly, Alaric's faction neither faced extermination nor was assimilated into the Roman fold, nor were they pushed out of the empire. The decline of the Western Roman Empire is vividly epitomized in the tumultuous tenure of Stilicho, the half-vandal Magister Militum. The Gothic leader, Alaric, initially sought a stable position within the Roman fold but, facing resistance, embarked on a series of military incursions, including sacking Athens. Meanwhile, the Eastern Roman Empire, with Constantinople at its heart, was not without its share of political machinations. Figures like Rufinus, Eutropius, and Gainas grappled for supremacy, leading to frequent shifts in military alliances. While dealing with these external threats, Stilicho faced internal pressures of severe financial strain, coupled with challenges in troop recruitment. Regions of the empire were often underdefended, inviting invasions and raids from various barbarian groups, including the notorious Huns, the Goths led by Radagaisus, and the Isaurians. In desperate measures to bolster defense, Stilicho even allowed the personal slaves of Roman soldiers to take up arms. Strategically, Stilicho sought to build alliances, notably with Alaric, to salvage the Western Empire's crumbling defenses. Yet, his plans often met resistance, even within the Roman Senate. As Stilicho eyed the East, especially after the transition of power from Arcadius to his son Theodosius II as a domain to exert influence, he met his downfall. A coup, spearheaded by Olympus, once an ally of Stilicho, marked the end of Stilicho's influence and underscored the treacherous and unstable landscape of Roman politics in this era. 
The backdrop of these events paints a vivid picture of an empire grappling with relentless external threats and debilitating internal discord. Stilicho's fall from power was abrupt. He received news of the coup while in Bononia, perhaps waiting for an alliance with Alaric. Even with a formidable army of varied barbarian factions, internal divisions, particularly between the Goths and the Huns, weakened his position. Cerus's Goths killed the Hun contingent, leading Stilicho to retreat to Ravenna for safety. There, under the false promise of sanctuary, he was betrayed and executed. In the aftermath, Alaric found himself officially declared as an enemy by the Roman state. In a tragic turn of events, Federate troops, presumably associated with Stilicho, witnessed the brutal murder of their families. They defected to Alaric, exacerbating the crisis for the empire, which was already mired in political purges and lacking an organized defense mechanism. Further south, Heraclianus, the ruler of Africa and a crucial supplier of grain to Italy, aligned himself only with Honorius's regime. Alaric's next moves revealed his strategic acumen. Recognizing the value of Rome's grain supply that flowed through its port, he besieged the Eternal City in 408. The suffering within Rome's walls was immense, leading to a hefty ransom to end the siege. Rome's wealthy elite failed to contribute significantly, leading to the stripping of pagan temples for funds. Moreover, Alaric managed to bolster his ranks, enticing many of Rome's slaves with promises of freedom. Regrouping in Tuscany, Alaric continued to strengthen his army, recruiting more slaves. Concurrently, Athalf, Alaric's brother-in-law, made his way through Italy to join forces with him. Despite some skirmishes with Hunnic mercenaries along the way, Athalf's arrival signified a consolidation of Gothic power in Italy, further escalating the challenges facing the Roman Empire. The geopolitics of the time was a maze of shifting alliances, with figures like Ceres playing both sides as the empire's future hung in the balance. The year 409 was marked by political intrigue and bloodshed. Olympus met a grisly end, with his ears cut off before being beaten to death. In the same year, Alaric, weary of war, sought reconciliation with Honorius, but was met with disdain and insult, further escalating tensions. Despite Alaric's overtures for peace, the Romans, overly confident and underestimating the Goths' determination, spurned his pleas. The situation worsened when Alaric took Galla Placidia, Honorius's sister, and marched to Rome. There, a desperate senate, recognizing the dire situation, collaborated with Alaric, allowing him to install Priscus Attalus as a puppet emperor. The move was a clear threat to Honorius. However, Attalus's reign was short-lived and inconsequential, with Alaric soon dethroning him. In 410, Alaric, unable to secure a treaty or adequate provisions, resorted to laying siege to Rome. The historic city, starved and vulnerable, fell to the Goths, who sacked it for three days. Interestingly, the invasion was not marked by mindless devastation, but had episodes of restraint, especially in Christian places. The fall of Rome, a city that hadn't been conquered for over eight centuries, sent shockwaves throughout the empire. Its fall instigated intense theological and philosophical debate. Augustine's City of God emerged as a significant text, redirecting Christian thought from the temporal to the eternal, transcending earthly tragedies. Following Rome's fall, in a bid to regain control, Honorius briefly relaxed laws against pagans in military positions. One such beneficiary, Generatus, notably restored Roman rule in Dalmatia using progressive military strategies. However, these reforms were fleeting, as the restrictions on pagans were reinstated soon after. A peculiar anecdote from this time, as recounted by Procopius, underscores the detachment and alleged ineptitude of Honorius. Upon hearing of Roma's fall, the emperor mourned for his pet chicken of the same name, rather than the once invincible city. This story, whether true or exaggerated, paints a picture of an emperor so out of touch with reality that the fall of his empire's most iconic city seemed less significant than the loss of a pet. After the monumental sack of Rome, Alaric set his sights on Africa, a region rich in resources and a crucial grain supplier for the Roman Empire. However, fate had other plans for him. Nature intervened, destroying his fleet in a violent storm, a setback that was shortly followed by his untimely death due to fever. 
This marked the end of a crucial chapter in the history of the Goths and the Roman Empire. Alaric's successor, Athulf, found himself in a precarious position. The Roman Empire, despite the repeated blows it had suffered, still did not recognize the Goths as legitimate rulers or allies, offering only sporadic and short-term supplies. Facing continuous hostilities and the pressing need to feed his people, Athulf decided to leave Italy and move to Gaul. The region was embroiled in its own set of challenges, but at least held the promise of sustenance. It's during these tumultuous times that historians believe the Visigoths, as they are commonly known in modern historiography, began forging their distinct identity. While they were initially just another barbarian group to the Romans, the Visigoths, under the leadership of figures like Alaric and Athalf and through their interactions with the Roman world, started to see themselves as a unified entity with shared aspirations and destiny. The decline of the Western Roman Empire during this era was marked by a cascade of political upheavals, incessant usurpations, and large-scale barbarian incursions. One of the significant turning points was the crossing of the Rhine in 405-406 AD. Numerous Germanic tribes, such as the Vandals, Alans, and Swabi, poured across the frozen river, deeply penetrating Roman territories. This massive movement might have been spurred by the westward expansion of the Huns, which displaced various tribes in their path. While Rome grappled with these external challenges, its grasp on distant provinces like Britannia began to wane. The weakened Roman forces there elevated several usurpers, with Constantine III emerging as the most formidable. Expanding his influence from Britannia to Gaul, he even shared the title of co-emperor with Honorius briefly. However, this ascendancy was short-lived. After his forces were vanquished, Constantine III met a grim end. Amid these tumultuous times, the people of Britannia, feeling the weight of abandonment, ousted Constantine's officials. In a desperate plea for assistance, they turned to Emperor Honorius, only to be informed they were essentially on their own. This marked a decisive end to Roman influence in Britannia, setting the stage for its eventual fragmentation into smaller kingdoms. Parallel to these events, the Visigoths, under Athalf's leadership, made their presence felt in Gaul. Athalf, who succeeded Alaric, initially harbored dreams of crafting a Gothic empire. However, realizing the daunting nature of this vision, he pivoted towards supporting the beleaguered Roman Empire. This shift in stance was symbolized by his marriage to Galla Placidia, Honorius's sister, signaling a tentative alliance between the Goths and Romans. However, this alliance was fragile, tested continuously by territorial and resource-driven skirmishes. Adding to Honorius's challenges was Heraclianus, the leader from the vital African province. Ambitious and defiant, Heraclianus posed a formidable threat when he revolted and launched an invasion into Italy. But his campaign eventually faltered, leading to his defeat and subsequent assassination upon his return to Africa. The period following Athalf's leadership, particularly after his unexpected death in Barcelona, was marked by instability. The Visigoths, now under Walia, found themselves in a precarious position with no formal agreements binding them to the Roman Empire. This led to increased tensions as they sought sustenance and territory in an ever-changing landscape. Throughout this period, the Western Roman Empire seemed to be perpetually teetering on the brink, facing challenges both from within and outside its borders. With weakened central authority and a relentless influx of barbarian tribes, the once mighty empire was set on a path of decline and eventual dissolution. From 416 onward, the political landscape of the Western Roman Empire underwent some stabilization. Walia, who had taken over the leadership of the Visigoths, made an agreement with Constantius, a powerful Roman figure at the time. This agreement saw the return of Galla Placidia, Honorius' sister, to the Roman fold in exchange for a significant provision of wheat. Over the next couple of years, Walia and his Goths played a pivotal role in restoring some semblance of order to the troubled Hispania, especially through their campaigns against the Siling Vandals and the Alans. By 418, Walia's Goths had reached another agreement with Constantius, securing land in Aquitania for farming. Constantius, recognizing the importance of keeping the provinces united, also reintroduced an annual council for the southern Gallic provinces, meeting at Arlate. 
However, there were significant shifts in the structure and composition of the Western Field Army. As a result of numerous wars since 395, half of the army's original units were replaced, and the new army consisted largely of regraded barbarians and troops moved from the frontier. The Notitia Dignitatum, a document from that era, sheds light on the structure of this revamped army, indicating a significant force still under Rome's command, spread across various regions. In the midst of these changes, Constantius solidified his influence by marrying Galla Placidia in 417. The union was not without controversy, given Placidia's initial resistance. The couple soon had two children, Honoria and Valentinian III. By 420, Constantius ascended to the prestigious position of Augustus. Though this elevation led to tensions with the eastern court, Constantius's grip on the Western Empire grew stronger, both politically and militarily. This entire period signifies an important stabilization phase for the empire. As captured in a poem by Rutilius Nemesianus, there was a palpable hope of a prosperous restoration, even as he lamented the scars of war seen on his voyage back to Gaul. Yet, the empire had endured significant territorial losses. In regions like Gaul, the Loire River began to serve as the effective northern boundary. The Franks had also gained control over large portions in the east of Gaul. Moreover, regions that had previously been burdened by the Goths saw tax reliefs, marking the economic strain the empire had undergone. Though the empire had managed to reintroduce some semblance of order, challenges persisted. Large barbarian groups remained across the vast territories, often operating outside Roman oversight. While some groups showed a semblance of allegiance to Rome, their loyalties were often transient, driven by immediate interests and the absence of strong Roman leadership. The death of Constantius in 421 marked the beginning of a turbulent decade for the Western Roman Empire. Constantius, ensuring no ready successor, left a vacuum of power. His young children were not positioned to assume his role, and the emperor, Honorius, was engulfed by the intricacies of his court, unable to effectively rule. Galla Placidia, Constantius's widow, initially tried to position her son for future ascendancy. However, rival factions forced her and her children to flee to the Eastern Empire in 422. The Western Empire faced more tumult when Honorius passed away in 423. Amidst the political chaos, Jonas was declared Western Emperor by the influential patrician Castinus. The Eastern Roman Empire countered by naming the child, Valentinian III, backed by his mother and regent, Galla Placidia. Despite being short on loyal forces, Jonas dispatched Aetius to muster support from the formidable Huns. But before Aetius could effectively act, the Eastern Empire swiftly dealt with Jonas, he was publicly humiliated and executed. Aetius, now bolstered by Hunnic forces, emerged as a dominant military figure in Italy. Realizing his might, Placidia struck a deal, resulting in the Huns being paid to depart and Aetius being appointed Magister Militum. Galla Placidia, despite her influential position, faced a crucial limitation. Roman traditions prohibited women from military leadership. Therefore, she tried to maintain stability by distributing power among her top officers, Aetius in Gaul, Count Boniface in Africa, and Flavius Felix in Italy. However, the empire's territories continued to erode. Hispania faced a decline in central authority, the Rhine frontier in Gaul was jeopardized, and Bugatti factions controlled regions like Armorica. Aetius, however, proved to be a relentless commander, dealing with multiple threats, from Visigoths and Franks to internal rebels. But the empire's leadership remained in a fragile state. By 427, disputes between Felix and Boniface escalated, leading Boniface to ally with Vandals, among others. The following year marked the ascendancy of the Vandal king Genseric. He masterfully migrated his people, including the Alans, from Hispania to Mauritania, eventually defeating Boniface in Numidia. Amidst these events, Boniface and Aetius clashed in 432 at the Battle of Ravenna. The encounter left Aetius defeated and Boniface fatally injured. Aetius, however, managed to rally support from the Huns once more, consolidating his position in 433. 
Interestingly, he never attempted to become an emperor, ensuring the trust of the Eastern Empire ruled by Theodosius II. During the 5th century AD, the Western Roman Empire grappled with both external invasions and internal strife. A web of leadership struggles saw figures like Galla Placidia trying to maintain a delicate balance of power in the court, only to face challenges that led her to seek refuge in the Eastern Empire. The military prowess of the empire, once unmatched, began to wane as they faced off against various barbarian groups, including the Visigoths, Vandals, Franks, and Sueves. The formidable Aetius made efforts to stabilize regions like Gaul and Hispania, even leveraging Hunnic forces to his advantage. But despite his military strategies, the empire was continually tested. The Vandals, led by King Genseric, posed a particular threat, capturing the prosperous city of Carthage and thereby dealing a severe blow to the empire's economy. This loss forced the empire into increasing taxation, putting further strain on its citizens. Corruption and negligence took a toll on the once disciplined Roman military, with even basic equipment standards falling by the wayside. The socio-economic disparity widened, with the elite continuing to enjoy privileges while the common people bore the brunt of economic hardships. This growing discontent pushed many towards rebel groups like the Bugatti or to seek refuge with barbarian factions. All these factors painted a picture of an empire in decline, with its once great status fading amidst external threats and internal decay. In 444 AD, the formidable Attila united the Huns, further bolstering his power by aligning with various Germanic tribes. His dominance wasn't just military, it was economically strategic, as he ensured the loyalty of his followers with continuous rewards, primarily in precious metals. While Attila consistently attacked the Eastern Empire, extracting wealth and concessions, a twist of fate turned his attention to the West. Anuria, the Western Emperor's sister, opposed to an arranged marriage, sent Attila a plea for aid. Viewing this as an opportunity, Attila claimed her as his wife and demanded half the Western Empire as her dowry. Denied his demand, Attila invaded Gaul in 451 with an enormous army. The subsequent Battle of the Catalanian Plains saw Attila's forces halted by a coalition of the West's internal barbarian forces, led by the Roman general, Aetius. In a subsequent campaign, Attila advanced on Italy towards Rome. However, a mix of disease, logistical issues, threats at home, and possibly an intervention by Pope Leo I curtailed his Italian venture. The unexpected death of Attila in 453 led to the rapid disintegration of his empire. Meanwhile, the Roman Empire's troubles compounded, insufficient troops and rampant barbarian aggression made maintaining territories like the Upper Danube increasingly untenable. In an internal power struggle, Aetius was assassinated by Emperor Valentinian in 454, who, in turn, was killed a year later. Petronius Maximus, a senatorial elite and a conspirator in both murders, ascended to the throne. His decisions, particularly breaking a key engagement with the Vandals, led to Rome's vulnerability. Unable to defend against the Vandals, the city fell prey to another sack. The Vandals, after their pillage, left with vast amounts of treasure and Eudocia, who would become intricately linked to the Vandal dynasty. In the wake of the power vacuum left in the Roman Empire, Avitus saw an opportunity. At the Visigothic court in Bertigola, he declared himself emperor. This wasn't just a bold claim by a hopeful ruler, it was backed by the might of the Visigoths, a significant barbarian power at the time. With this support, Avitus approached Rome. He wasn't unchallenged, but managed to secure the approval of Majorian and Rissimer, who led the remnants of the Italian army. This signaled a historic shift, as it was the first instance where a barbarian kingdom played such a pivotal role in determining who would become the Roman emperor. The narrative at this time underwent a makeover. Sidonius Apollinaris, Avitus's son-in-law, penned narratives portraying Theoderic II, the Visigothic king, as a rational and diplomatic leader, ideal for Roman collaboration. But Theoderic's incentives weren't just ideological or for power's sake, he was handsomely rewarded, both in the form of Italy's dwindling public treasures and the promise of an independent campaign in Hispania. This campaign wasn't merely against the Sueves, whom he defeated, but also resulted in the plundering of Roman cities. 
As Theoderic expanded his influence, other barbarian kingdoms followed suit, the Burgundians in the Rhone Valley and the Vandals in Africa. By 456, the Visigoths were heavily engaged in Hispania, reducing their immediate threat to Italy. The same year, Majorian and Rissimer found an opportune moment to challenge Avitus, defeating him near Placentia. The once emperor, in a sharp turn of fate, was compelled to adopt a religious mantle, becoming the bishop of Placentia. His tenure, however, was short-lived, as he died shortly after, under potentially suspicious circumstances. The empire's politics during this period were a testament to the turbulent times, where alliances shifted rapidly and power was in perennial flux. In the tumultuous aftermath of the Roman Empire's decline, Majorian and Rissimer emerged as dominant figures in Italy. While Rissimer, with his mixed Suvic and Gothic royal lineage, couldn't aspire to sit on the imperial throne, Majorian was in a position to be declared Augustus. With his new title, Majorian undertook expansive measures to rejuvenate the weakening empire. Historian Edward Gibbon portrays Majorian as a paragon of leadership, attributing to him heroism and greatness. Determined to restore the empire's lost glory, Majorian revitalized both the army and navy. He was adamant about regaining control over the Gallic provinces that had turned their backs on him. His military campaigns saw him triumph over various factions. The Visigoths, once a considerable threat, were subdued in the Battle of Arlate, compelling them to relinquish their aspirations in Hispania. The Burgundians, Gallo-Romans, Suevi, and Bagadi were also brought under his command. The influential military leader Marcel Linus, stationed in Dalmatia, pledged his loyalty to Majorian and successfully reclaimed Sicily from the Vandals. Aegidius, another crucial figure, not only recognized Majorian's authority but also effectively governed northern Gaul, possibly under the title King of the Franks. Majorian wasn't just a military leader, he showcased his administrative prowess by rectifying the abusive tax collection system and bolstering city councils. Both were essential steps in resurrecting the empire's might, even if they came at the expense of the elite aristocracy. His ambitions also extended to Africa, for which he prepared a massive fleet in Carthago Nova. However, as is common in tales of power and ambition, betrayal lurked around the corner. A conspiracy resulted in his fleet being destroyed, forcing Majorian to broker peace with the Vandals. Upon his return to Italy, the once ally, Rissimer, arrested and executed Majorian after just five days. The subsequent reign of Rissimer was one of puppets and manipulations. The provinces led by Marcellinus and Aegidius distanced themselves from Rissimer's authority, upholding a semblance of Roman rule. In a strategic move, Rissimer allied with the Visigoths against Aegidius, further fragmenting the once mighty Roman Empire. From 461 to 465, the figurehead emperor was Libius Severus, an Italian noble, whose reign is notably lackluster in historical accounts, having achieved little and dying under convenient circumstances in 465. The vacuum created by two years without a Western emperor prompted the Eastern Roman court to intervene, nominating Anthemius, a celebrated general with a potential claim to the Eastern throne, as the solution. Anthemius's arrival in Italy, accompanied by a robust military force and the backing of Marcellinus with his naval fleet, signaled renewed hope for the empire. To solidify the political alliance, Anthemius married off his daughter, Alipia, to Rissimer and subsequently ascended to the title of Augustus in 467. The subsequent year witnessed a monumental effort by the Eastern Empire to assist the West in reclaiming the Diocese of Africa from the Vandals. Initial victories, spearheaded by Marcellinus, saw the Vandals pushed out of strategic locations like Sardinia and Sicily. However, a tactical error in judgment by the Roman commander-in-chief during the Cape Bon confrontation allowed the Vandals, led by Genseric, to retaliate with devastating effect. Utilizing the advantage of a truce, the Vandals launched a surprise offensive, inflicting a catastrophic blow on the Roman fleet. The reverberations of this defeat were profound. The Vandals solidified their grip on Africa and recaptured previously lost territories. Amidst this backdrop, Marcellinus's assassination, potentially orchestrated by Rissimer, further weakened the Roman stance. 
While the political landscape of the empire grew increasingly complex, Anthemius still retained military control in Italy. In northern Gaul, Riathemus led a British force, siding with the Roman Empire's interests. Anthemius sought to restore Roman influence in southern Gaul, envisioning a land route to Hispania. However, these ambitions were crushed by the Visigoths at the Battle of Alls, leading to the near-complete loss of Roman territories in southern Gaul. An internal rift developed between Anthemius and Rissimer, culminating in the latter besieging Rome. The once great city, weakened by prolonged hunger, capitulated in July 472. In a tragic turn of events, Anthemius was captured and, under Rissimer's directive, met his end at the hands of the Burgundian prince, Gundabad. As the sands of time continued to shift, Rissimer's own life was cut short by a pulmonary hemorrhage in August. His newly appointed emperor, Alibrius, facing the volatile dynamics of the empire, soon appointed Gundabad to a prominent position, only to have his reign abruptly curtailed by his own demise. The sequence of events you've described marks the traditional end of the Western Roman Empire and the beginning of the Middle Ages in the West. The deposition of Romulus Augustulus by Odoacer in 476 AD is typically identified as the fall of the Western Roman Empire, even though the Eastern Roman Empire would continue for another thousand years until 1453. After the deposition of Romulus, Odoacer didn't claim the title of Emperor of the West. Instead, he declared himself King of Italy, highlighting a departure from Roman tradition. He acknowledged the suzerainty of the Eastern Emperor, and this action emphasized the shift of the center of power to Constantinople. It's important to remember that this fall of the Western Roman Empire wasn't an abrupt event. It was the culmination of several centuries of economic decay, internal strife, military defeats, and external pressures, especially from various Germanic tribes. Romulus Augustulus is often remembered because he was the last emperor, but in the grand tapestry of Roman history, his reign was merely a brief and symbolic moment. The end of the Western Roman Empire was more about the profound transformation of the ancient world than the end of a young emperor's rule. The legacy of the Roman Empire, however, continued to shape European civilization for centuries in various forms, from the Byzantine Empire in the East to the Holy Roman Empire in the West. Though conventionally the Western Roman Empire's end is marked by Odoacer's deposition of Romulus Augustulus in 476 AD, the empire's legacy persisted in various forms. Despite the political shifts, Roman territories like Dalmatia under Julius Nepos and the domain of Swassa under Syagrius still held semblances of Roman rule. Additionally, regions like Mauritania showed strong Roman traits, evident in their resistance to outside conquests and alignments with figures like Justinian I. Meanwhile, in Britain, remnants of Roman civilization persisted, even as material conditions deteriorated. Odoacer's political maneuvers with the Eastern Roman Emperor Zeno further complicated the narrative. While Zeno recognized Odoacer's dominion over Italy, he insisted that Odoacer acknowledge Julius Nepos's titular role. Subsequent political machinations saw Odoacer's kingdom overtaken by Theoderic the Great, culminating in a treacherous banquet where Theoderic personally ended Odoacer's life. Through all these upheavals, institutions like the Western Roman Senate remained, albeit with diminishing power, symbolizing Rome's lingering influence well into the early Middle Ages. Thank you for watching this episode of History Uncovered. Our journey through the intricate details of the Western Roman Empire's final chapters showcases the ebb and flow of empires and the legacy they leave behind. If you found this video informative and engaging, please like and subscribe to our channel for more fascinating stories from the past. Your support is what drives us to dig deeper into history's rich tapestry. And don't forget to ring the bell for notifications so that you never miss a new video. For those eager to continue exploring, the algorithm suggests another captivating episode on the screen right now. Check it out and dive back into the annals of history with us.